Thank you. 
sorry, mercenary people who stipulated a trifle on account. How tiresome. Well, let us hope the Grand Inquisitor is a blind gentleman. Ah, and the man who was to have had the honor of escorting us, I see no band. Your Grace, uh, the band are a sordid people who require payment in advance. That's so like a band. <laughs> Ah, insufferable difficulties meet me at every turn. But surely they know his grace. Exactly. They know his grace. <laughs> Let us hope the Grand Inquisitor is a deaf gentleman. A coronet stone would be at least something. You, you do not happen to have the accomplishment of to link like a coronet stone? Alas, Your Grace, I cannot. But I can imitate a farmyard. I don't see how that could help us. I don't see how it could bring it in. It would not help us in the least. We are not a parcel of graziers come to market. Adult. My love. Our sweet feelings. Be so good as to ring the bell and inform the Grand Inquisitor that the Duke of Pladatoro, Count Matadoro, Baron Kikadoro, and sweet, oh, and sweet, have arrived and seek desire, demand, demand an audience. Your Grace has much to demand. I can cure of it. I built you all of it. <laughs> and now, my love, <coughs> and now, my love, should we tell her? I think so. And now, my love, prepare for the most magnificent surprise. It is my agreeable duty to reveal to you a secret which should make you the happiest young lady in Venice. A secret? A secret which, for state reasons, it was necessary to preserve for 20 years. As a prattling babe of only six months old, you were married, by proxy, to no less a personage than the infant son and heir of his majesty, the immeasurably wealthy King of Baratalia. Married to the infant son of the king of Barataria? Was I consulted? That it was a most unpardonable liberty. Consider his extreme youth and forgive him. Six months after the ceremony, the misguided monarch uh, abandoned the creed of his forefathers. The Grand Inquisitor determined that that innovation should not be perpetuated in Barataria arranged for your smiling and unconscious husband to be stolen and conveyed to Venice. Fortnight after, that monarch and all his court were killed in an insurrection. <laughs> and now we are here in Venice to ascertain the whereabouts of your husband and to hail you, our daughter, as Her Majesty, the Queen of Barataria. Your Majesty, it's at such moments that one feels how necessary it is to travel with a full band. I, the Queen of Barataria, but I've nothing to wear. We are practically penniless. That point has not escaped me, although we are un unhappily in strange circumstances at the moment, my social influence is something enormous. And a company to be called the Duke of Plaza Toro Limited is in process of formation to work me. An influential directorate has been secured, and I myself shall join the board after allotment. Am I to understand that the Queen of Barataria may be called upon at any time to witness her honored sire in process of liquidation? The speculation is not exempt from that drawback. Should your father stop, 
it will, of course, be necessary to wind him back up. But it's so undignified, it's so degrading. A grandee of Spain turned into a public company? Such a thing was never heard of. My child, the Duke of Plaza Toro does not follow fashions. He leads them. He always leads everyone. When he was in the army, he led his regiment. Occasionally, he led them into action. Invariably, he led them out. <laughs> Prize of Marshal Kai Munde while saying he fight. He led his regiment from behind, he found it less exciting. But when away his regiment ran, his place was at the Foro. The celebrated Hawk of Vegas was in the fifth. We've got plans in four. In the first of four was fight. He always got the night. And celebrated, cultivated, everything in Rome in the Duke of Positoro. That they would all be shot unless they left the service. That hero hesitated, not so marvelous his nerves. He sent his resignation in the first of all his horror. That we've got Plaza Toro to end the gross and great war. He always turned the way. And very low and coming, flowing, easy going, pallid in the Duke of Plaza Toro. And very low and coming, flowing, easy going, pallid in the Duke of Plaza Toro. Yet it is logical enough. 
You say you cease to love me. I say I may not love you. Ah, but you do not say you did not love me. I loved you with a frenzy that words are powerless to express. And that but ten brief minutes since. <laughs> exactly. Thy own until ten minutes since. My late love, my recently adored, tell me that until, say, a quarter of an hour ago, I was all in all to thee. I see your idea. It's ingenious. But don't do that. There can be no harm in reveling in the past. None whatever, but an embrace cannot be taken to act retrospectively. Perhaps not. We may recollect an embrace. I recollect many. <laughs> but we must not repeat them. Then let us recollect a few. Oh. Oh, Silva, <laughs> you were to me as the sun is to the earth. A quarter of an hour ago? About that. And to think that but for this miserable discovery, you would have been my own for life. Through life and through death. About a quarter of an hour ago. How greedily my thirsty ears would have drunk the golden melody of those sweet words. A quarter of an hour ago. Now it's about twenty minutes since. About that. In such matters one cannot be too precise. And now our love, so full of life, is but a silent, solemn memory. Must it be so, Casilda? Louise, it must be so. <laughs>
Don Alhambra del Bolero, the Grand Inquisitor of Spain. It was his distinction who so thoughtfully abstracted your infant husband and brought him to Venice. So this is the little lady who is so unexpectedly arrives to assume the functions of royalty. And a nice little lady, too. Zip, is it? Yes, distinctly yip. But allow me. Oh! Naughty temper. You must make some allowance. Her Majesty's head is a little turned by her access of dignity. I can only wish that her access of dignity was turned in this direction. Unfortunately, if I am not mistaken, there is some little doubt as to His Majesty's whereabouts. A doubt as to his whereabouts? Then we may have be saved. A doubt? Oh, doubt, no doubt at all. He's here in Venice, flying the modest but picturesque calling as a gondolier. I see him every day. I know his address. In all the annals of our history, there's absolutely no circumstance so completely free of any doubt of any kind whatsoever. Listen, and I'll tell you all about it. I stole the prince and I brought him here and left him gaily prattling with a highly respectable gondolier who promised the royal babe to rear and teach him the trade of a gondolier with his own beloved prattling. Both the babes were strong and doubted, considering all things clever. Of that there is no manner of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. But owing I am disposed to fear for his terrible taste for tippling, that highly respectable gondolier could never declare with a mind sincere which of the two was his offspring dear and which the royal stripling. Which was which he could never make out, despite his best endeavor. Of that there is no matter of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. I fled, and when at the end of the year I saw that, that infant cherished, the highly respectable gondolier, liars of corpse on a humble beer. I shed a, a grand inquisitor's tear. That gondolier had perished. A taste for drink combined with doubt had doubled him up forever. Of that there is no matter of doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. No possible doubt whatever. The children followed his old career. That statement can't be patterned of a highly respectable gondolier. Oh, what are the two who will soon be here? But which of the two, it is not quite clear, is the royal prince you married. Search in and out and round the map, and you'll discover never a tale so free of any doubt, no probable possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt ever. A tale so free of any doubt, no possible possible shadow of doubt, no possible doubt whatever. But it is impossible to say which? Without any kind, any kind of doubt of any sort whatsoever. But be assured, the hearse to whom your husband was entrusted is the mother of this musical young man who is such a past master of that delicately modulated instrument. She can no doubt assume the identity of the king's identity beyond any question. Heavens, how did he know that? My young friend, the Grand Inquisitor is always up to date. His mother is currently the wife of a highly respected and old established brigand who has an extensive practice in the mountains around Cordoba. Accompanied by one of my emissaries, he will go to her address and return with her here. And if she has any difficulty making up her mind, the persuasive methods of the torture chamber should jog her memory. <laughs> Who can tell if 
Unsleemly wrangle. Such complications frequently occur. Life is one constant, complicated tangle. Death is the only true unraveler. Try we life long, we can never sweeten the voice and the sting. Why should we in vain endeavor guess and guess and guess again? Life's a pony full of plants. Here's a pickle that we don't. Life's a pony full of plants. Here's a pickle that we don't.
son of the late king of Barataria. What? And I trust, I trust it was this one who clapped me on the shoulder and called me his man. The king of what Barataria? Of Barataria. What is it? But which is it? What does it matter? Since you're both Republican and hold all kings in detestation, you will abdicate it once. Oh, 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 that? oh, well, as to that, of course, there are kings and kings. When I say I detest kings, I mean I detest Bad kings. I see, it's a delicate distinction. Quite so. Now, I can conceive of a kind of king, an ideal king, a creature of my fancy, you know, who would be absolutely unobjectionable. Such a king would abolish taxes and make everything cheap except gondolas. And give a great many free entertainments to the gondoliers. And let fireworks over the Grand Canal and hire all the gondolas for the occasion. And scramble money across the Rialto for the gondoliers. Such a king would be a blessing to his people. And if I were king, that is the sort of king I would be. And so would I. Well, I'm glad to see your objections are not insuperable. Oh, no. Oh, no. They're, they're not, not insuperable. No, no they're, they're not, not insuperable. insuperable. Besides, we are open to conviction. Oh, yes, they're open to conviction. Oh, they've often been convicted. <laughs> Our views may have been hastily formed on insufficient grounds. They may be crude, ill-digested, erroneous. I have a very poor opinion of a politician who isn't open to conviction. Oh, he's a fine fellow. Yes, that's the politician for my money. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's settled. Now, since your country is in a state of insurrection, you must return at once to take over the reins of government. And since, until we ascertain which one of you is king, I have arranged for you to reign jointly. So that no 
thereafter there's no question of the validity of your acts. As one individual? As one individual. Like this? Something like that. And we may bring our friends with us and give them places about the court? Yeah, undoubtedly. That's always done. I'm convinced. So am I. Then the sooner off the better. Will this run home the Oh, no, 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 sorry, no, no. Ladies are not admitted. What? Uh, 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 for a time. Uh, maybe later. We'll see. You don't mean you're going to separate us from our wives. Ugh, this is extremely awkward. For a time, a few months. What is a few months? Well, we've only been married half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I bid you all, I'm a bad you all, 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 bad you all,
Pantheons and palaces, but you'll find I read the Republican fallacies. You'll find I read the Republican fallacies. As we know, we object to pavilions and palaces. How can they respect our Republican fallacies? To everyone who feels inclined, supposed we undertake to find congenial with this frame of mind, and all shall equal be. The Chancellor and his Peruk, the Earl, the Marquis, and the Duke, the Duke, the Butler, and the Duke, they all shall equal be. The aristocrat who paints and coots, the aristocrat who hunts and shoots, the aristocrat who scrubs our boots, they all shall equal be. The noble lord who rules the state, the noble lord who cleans the plates, the noble lord who scrubs the grates, they all shall equal be. The lord my bishop, or the doctor, the lord my coach, on the rocks, and all have vagabond on the stocks, they all shall equal be. To everyone who feels the kind, suppose we undertake to find the genial with his brave of one, the genial with his brave of one, and all shall equal be. Sing, I sing, go wherever they go. Sing, I sing, go wherever they go. Wherever they go, wherever they go, they all shall equal be. Sing, I sing, go wherever they go. Sing, I sing, go Yeah. 
Situated as we are, we can't recognize two independent responsibilities. Yes, but you can recognize two independent appetites. It's all well to say that we act as one person, but when you give us one ration between us, I should describe that as a legal fiction taken a little too far. It's rather a nice point. I don't like to express an opinion offhand. Suppose we reserve it for argument before the full court. Yes, but what are we to do in the meantime? We want, we want our, our team. team. I think we may make an interim order for double ration. Or your majesty that raise the usual undertaking to identify in the case of an adverse decision. That, I think, will mind the case, but you must work hard. Stick to it. Nothing like work. Oh, certainly. We quite understand that a man who holds the magnificent position of king should do something to justify it. The least we can do would make ourselves useful around the palace. Rising early in the morning, we proceed to light the fire, and our majesty adorning in its work a day attire. We embark without delay on the duties of the day. First, they polish up some badges of political dispatches and foreign politicians circumvent. And if business isn't heavy, we may hold a royal levy or ratify some acts of parliament. Then we probably review the household troops with the usual shala hoops and shala hoops and receive in ceremonial and state an interesting piece of potentate. Then we go and stand the sentry at the palace, private entry, marching in and marching in and up and down and to and fro. While the army or our booty goes in search of greater beauty, and a generally happens that he has a bunch of gold. He relieves us if he's able to the time to lay the table, then we die and have some coffee at then half past twelve or one. With a pleasure that's emphatic, we retire to our attic with the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Oh, philosophers may sing of the troubles of a king, and the pleasures there are many, 
and of worries there are none, and the culminating pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done. Oh, 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 oh. Alas, friends, we sing of the troubles of the king, for the pleasures there are many and the worries there are none, and the culminating pleasure that we treasure beyond measure is the gratifying feeling that our duty has been done.
it was like this. After you left, the days crawled by, and we were all very dull and mopey, and you never wrote. So at last I said to Gianetta, I can't stand this any longer! Let us unpack up a change and see how they're getting on. And she said, done. And they all said, done. And we asked old Giacobo to let us his boat, and he said, done. And we've crossed the sea, and oh, thank goodness that is done. And, and, all right. Now, which of you is king? And which of us is queen? That we shall know until Nurse shows up. But never mind that. The question is, how shall we commence the celebration of our honeymoon? <laughs> Gentlemen, will you allow us to give you a magnificent banquet? We will! Thanks yes, very much. And ladies, what do you say to a dance? <laughs> a banquet and a dance! Oh, it is too much happiness! <laughs> Yes, I got you the fun day the whole year. Oh, a gift one from me a whole year. Oh, when it comes in the buckets and pans, let me see if I can the best. Oh, when it comes in the You see, the monarchy has been remodeled on Republican principles. What? All departments rank equally, and everybody's at the head of his department. I see. I'm afraid you're annoyed. No, 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 not that. It's just not quite what I expected. I'm very sorry. So am I. By the by, can I get you anything after your voyage? A plate of macaroni and a rusk? No, 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 nothing. Obliged to be careful. Uh, yes, uh, gout. Uh, you see, in every court there are distinctions that must be observed. There are, are there? For instance, you've never seen your Lord High Chancellor playing leapfrog with his own hook. Why not? Why not? Because the Lord High Chancellor is a personage of great, great distinguishes. He could never, under any circumstances, be put in a position to be told to tuck in his tuppity by anyone except a nobleman of equal rank. Now, the Lord High Archbishop may tell the Lord High Chancellor to tuck in his tuppity, but certainly not a cook, gentlemen. Certainly not a cook. Not even a Lord High cook. No, 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 no. Listen, I'll tell you an incident which this experiment was tried. There was a king, as I've been told, a wondrous working 
days of old, whose heart was twice as good as gold, and twenty times a fellow. We can look the rich in his face, and in his heart we found a place for all the ailing human race, and every wretched fellow. When he had relished wine to drink, made him very sad to think that some had drunk it for a drink, must be content with toddy. With toddy, must be content with toddy. He wished all men as rich as he, and he was rich as rich could be. So to the top of every tree promoted everybody. Now that's the kind of king for me, he wished no man as rich as he. So to the top of every tree promoted everybody. This king, although no one denies, his heart was of abnormal size. Though he have stated otherwise, if he had been a keeper, the end is easily foretold. If every blessed thing you hold is made of silver or of gold, you long for simple pewter. If you have nothing else to wear but cloth of gold and silver rare, or cloth of gold you cease to care, up goes the price of shoddy. Of shoddy, up goes the price of shoddy. In short, whoever you may be, to this conclusion you'll agree. If everyone is somebody, then no one's anybody. Now that the rain has broken, we to this conclusion we agree. If everyone is somebody, then no one's anybody. Important news to communicate. The Duke, this Grace, the Duke of Positori, her Grace, the Duchess, and their beautiful daughter, Casilda. I said, their beautiful daughter, Casilda, we heard you, have arrived in Barataria and will be here at any moment. The Duke and Duchess are nothing to us. But their beautiful daughter, oh, you are a lucky dog. One of you. I think you're a very incomprehensible old gentleman. Let me explain. Many years ago, when you, whichever you are, were a baby, you, whichever you are, were married to a little girl who is now grown to the most beautiful lady in Spain. And that lady will come to declaim you, whichever you are, in half an hour. And I wish that one, whichever it is, my heartiest congratulations with all of my heart. Married when a baby? But we were married three months ago. <laughs> Only one of you. The other is an unintentional bigamist. Look who is my bed! <laughs> who are these young people? Who are we? Why, why, why are we we've just, just arrived. I was? Oh, oh, God, this is very inconvenient. Oh, God, this just complicates matters. My, my goodness, what would Her Majesty say? And do you mean to tell me that one of these monarchs was already married? And that neither of us will be a queen? That is the message I intended to convey. Oh, Tessa, my dear, dear child. Get away. Perhaps it is you. My poor, poor little... Don't! Who knows whose husband you are? And pray, why didn't you tell us about this? Before they left Venice? Because if I had no earthly inducement, I could have convinced these gentlemen to leave two such extremely fascinating and utterly irresistible young ladies. Oh, well, there is something in that. But be assured, you won't have to be held in suspense long. The young lady who's nurse to whom your royal was entrusted is currently in the torture chamber, awaiting for me to interview her. Poor old girl. Shouldn't you go and put her out of her suspense? Oh, no, there's no hurry. She's all right. She has all the illustrated papers. However, I will go and interview her. In the meantime, might I suggest the absolute propriety of you conducting yourselves as single young ladies. Good evening. Well, here's a pleasant state of things. Delightful. One of us is married to two young ladies, and nobody knows which. 
and the other is married to one young lady whom nobody can identify. And one of us is married to one of you and the other to nobody. But which of you is married to which of us? What's to become of the other? It's quite simple. Observe. Two husbands have managed to acquire three wives. Three wives, two husbands. That's two thirds of a husband for each wife. Oh, that's for serious. Here we are in arithmetic. My good sir, one can't marry a vulgar fraction. You've no right to call me a vulgar fraction. We are getting rather mixed. The situation is entangled. Let us try and comb it out. In a contemplated fashion, and a tranquil frame of mind, freed from every kind of passion, some solution let us find. pretty well. She's a silly still. She answers pretty well. Now when we were pretty babies, someone married us, that's clear. And if I can catch Bob the Chirrut's girl and send her away with a plenary. That young lady married to receive her can refuse. So, if I overtake her, I'll warrant I'll make her to shake and her aristocratical ship. She married who just
be good enough to inform His Majesty that the Duke of Pladatoro, Limited, has arrived and begs, desire, demands, demands an audience. And now, my child, prepare to receive the husband with whom you were united in such interesting and romantic circumstances. But which of them is it? There are two of them. It is true that at present His Majesty is a double gentleman. But as soon as the circumstances of his marriage have been ascertained, he will, ipso facto, boil down to a single gentleman thus presenting the unique example of an individual who becomes a single man and a married man in the same operation. So I have known instances in which the characteristics of both conditions existed concurrently in the same individual. Ah, but he couldn't have been a plus at all. Oh, couldn't he, though? Well, whatever happens, I shall, of course, be a dutiful wife. But I can never love my husband. I don't know. It's extraordinary what unprepossessing people one can love if one puts one's mind to it. I loved your father. My love! That remark is a little hard, I think. Rather cruel, perhaps? A little uncalled for? I venture to believe. It was very difficult, my dear. But I said to myself, that man is a duke, and I will love him. Several of my relations bet me I couldn't, but I did. Desperately. My only hope is that when my husband realizes what a shady family he has married into, he will repudiate the contract altogether. Shady? A nobleman, shady, who is blazing in the luster of unaccustomed pocket money. A nobleman, shady, who can look back upon ninety-five quarterings. It's not every nobleman who has ninety-five quarterings in arrears. <coughs> I mean, who can look back upon ninety-five of them. And this, just as I've been floated at a premium. Oh, fine. Your Majesty is surely unaware that directly your Majesty's father came before the public, he was applied for over and over again. My dear, Her Majesty's father was in the habit of being applied for over and over again, and very urgently applied for, I might add, long before he was registered under the Limited Liability Act. To help unhappy commoners and add to their enjoyment affords a man of noble rank congenial employment. Of our attempts we offer you examples illustrative. The work is light and, I may add, is most remunerative. <laughs> Small titles and orders to mares and recorders I get, and they're highly delighted. They're highly delighted. MPs, baroneted, champ colonels gazetted, and second-rate aldermen knighted. Yes, aldermen knighted. Foundations, those laying, I find very pain. It adds a large sum to my making. Large sum to his making. At charity dinners, the best of speech dinners, I get 10% of the taking. Was 10 of the taking? At middle class party, I play and take party, and I'm by no means a beginner. She's not a beginner. For one of my station, a remuneration, five guineas a night, and my dinner. And why with her dinner? <laughs> I write letters plated, John Mayer's and speeding, and yours and yours. Believe me, you mustn't. And thou, my complexion derives its perfection from so many subways it doesn't. It certainly doesn't. <laughs> 
We're ready as witness to anyone's fitness to fill any place of preferment. A place of preferment. We're often in waiting and junket of baiting and sometimes a town of preferment. We enjoy an internment. Enjoy a kindle, a spark, a swindle, a simpleton, a tinty, a clutch, a tinty, a clutch. Yeah. 
she will declare to silver married sound the rightful king. Let him forthwith be crowned. She will declare to silver married sound.